Part three, chapter nine of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine The English Reformation, First Period, fifteen o nine to fifteen fifty three. The early attempts at reformation in England were in advance of those in any other part of Europe. To that country belongs the honor of having discovered the need of a universal religious regeneration in Europe. The beginnings of reform centered in Wycliffe, born about 1315. He was a student, and afterwards professor, in Oxford. His first position of hostility to the prevailing doctrines was his declaration against the mendicant monks, who went up and down the land, extorting money from the people, and preaching against learning and progress in every form. He issued several pamphlets against them, and called loudly to his countrymen to get rid of them. So signal was his service, that he was promoted to a wardenship in Oxford, namely, of Balliol Hall, or College. Four years later, in 1365, he became master of Canterbury Hall, or the Christ College of a later day. Schemes were soon in progress on the part of Langham, Archbishop of Canterbury, to eject Wycliffe, and the Pope issued a bull to that effect in 1370. Wycliffe replied by a tract against the papal policy, arraying itself in hostility to the nation. The king, Edward III, was already in revolt against the Pope, and took up the cause of Wycliffe, who was appointed a royal chaplain and rector of Lutterworth. Wycliffe gained a clearer view every year of the corruptions of the church, and preached boldly against them. He was summoned by the authorities of the church for trial for heresy, but the meeting ended in a violent dispute between the Bishop of London and the Duke of Lancaster, and nothing was done. He was indicted before the Pope for nineteen alleged heresies, and in 1377, the Pope issued no less than five bulls against him. A second time he was tried, and escaped through the sympathy of the people. The court, which was held in Lambeth Palace, broke up in disorder, but not without commanding Wycliffe to stop preaching and writing. But he was, if possible, more industrious than ever. He spared no evil that he saw about him, and hurled anathemas against willful Pope and deluded priesthood he died a natural death in his own house in Lutterworth. The same council which executed Huss, that of Constance in 1415, condemned the writings of Wycliffe, and in 1428 his dust was taken from the grave and cast out upon the Avon. The event gave rise to Fuller's lines, The Avon to the Severn runs, and Severn to the sea and Wycliffe's dust shall spread abroad, wide as the waters be. Wycliffe's greatest service to the coming Reformation was, first, his translation of the New Testament, and afterwards the whole Bible, into English. It was the first attempt at reproducing any considerable portion of the scriptures into the popular tongue, and was a new revelation to the English people. The original of his translation was the Latin Vulgate, a very faulty source, but yet good enough to create a thirst for better things and prepare the way for the pure word. Between Wycliffe and the reformers of Henry VIII's reign lay a period of nearly two centuries. But through all those years the seeds planted by Wycliffe never died. No great interval passed without some bold spirit arising, and saying strong words of protest against the errors of the times. The age was not ripe as yet for organized effort. The herald's mission must first be wrought out. The political character of the English Reformation was a striking feature from the outset. In this regard, the new movement differed from that in all other countries, except Holland. While the people were fully ready for religious revolt, the first organized rupture with Rome came from the king, Henry the Eighth. The influence of his court was favorable to the cause, not as a spiritual necessity, but as a means of national independence. Then came the inflow of Protestants from the continent. 
many learned men crossed the channel and settled in oxford and cambridge and conducted discussions in favor of the reformation among them may be mentioned ochino peter martyr martin Bousset, paul fagius and tremelius but greatest of all the men from abroad was erasmus whose greek new testament found a ready entrance into england he settled in cambridge and taught there henry's grievance against romanism was purely personal he wanted more wives than rome was willing to grant him he had been married while his father was yet king to catherine of aragon the daughter of ferdinand and isabella and the widow of henry the seventh's eldest son arthur the king for political reasons chose catherine as wife for his second son and successor on the throne henry the eighth after a marriage of nearly twenty years henry the eighth resolved on a divorce from catherine and the disinheriting of their daughter mary his object was to marry anne boleyn but the question was how to get the pope's consent wolsey was deputed to do this work and to proceed in person to rome should the pope consent he would offend the emperor charles v who would be insulted by the divorce of henry from catherine should he refuse he knew that it would be an affront to england he chose the latter as by that course he thought he would have less to lose what should henry the eighth do he had made public his determination the religious revolt in germany proved to him that rebellion against the papacy was in the air of the age his own people were eager for reform so he determined to put away his wife disavow his daughter and make anne boleyn his queen this brought about an open rupture with the pope henry's real purpose was a national roman catholic church with himself as head but this proved an impossibility he saw there could not be two independent catholicisms one on the tiber and the other on the thames he was borne along by the current of his people and found himself finally compelled to link himself ostensibly with the new protestantism and yet in reality deeply in sympathy with the old romanism henry the eighth was a roman catholic in all but name and endorsement of the papacy he despised the lutheran doctrines and even wrote against them his book against luther was so fully romanist that it was hailed in rome as a powerful attack on protestantism and it even secured to henry the eighth from leo the tenth the title of defender of the faith luther however went on steadily he was master of his theme and besides refuting the positions of henry paid him the compliment of saying when god wants a fool he turns a king into a theological writer there was no positively settled policy on the part of king or parliament one day the roman catholics under the lead of cardinal pole and bishop gardiner had the confidence of the king and on another thomas cromwell and cramner were the stronger parliament was the willing servant of a capricious tyrant and at one hour was ready to revoke its work of the preceding one as a proof of how nearly england remained roman catholic under henry the eighth we may mention the fact that at his dictation in fifteen thirty seven parliament established the following six articles of faith one transubstantiation or the real presence of christ in the bread and wine of the lord's supper two sufficiency of communion in one kind only three illegality of the marriage of priests four obligation of vows of celibacy five propriety of retaining private masses six necessity of the confessional it must be remembered however that notwithstanding all these attachments to the old romanism the country was gradually drifting away from it the old order was breaking up the bible was publicly distributed and protestant doctrines were gaining more friends every day colette fourteen sixty six to fifteen nineteen and sir thomas more fourteen eighty to fifteen thirty five were the great influence in bringing about the revolution in the popular mind 
the former had studied the classics in italy and brought with him to oxford an ardent love for the new humanism he introduced expository preaching and a perpetual divinity lecture three days of each week in st paul's church his great object of attack was the profligacy of the church from the papacy down through all grades of priesthood as he had witnessed it in rome he cried aloud for the redemption of his beloved england o oh, jesu christ wash for us not our feet only but also our hands and our head otherwise our disordered church cannot be far from death sir thomas more was a student in oxford when he imbibed the new learning and became intimate with erasmus and colette he was made lord chancellor of england on the fall of wolsey and was held in high esteem by the king he strongly opposed protestant doctrines however and could never bring his conscience to assent to the supremacy of henry over the church he incurred the king's displeasure by disapproving the latter's divorce from catherine of aragon and absented himself from the coronation of anne boleyn he refused to take the oath of allegiance to her as queen and was sent to the tower of london and afterwards beheaded he was a model of eloquence purity of heart domestic virtue simplicity and tenderness after kissing his executioner he said thou art to do me the greatest benefit that i can receive pluck up thy spirit man and be not afraid to do thine office my neck is very short take heed therefore that thou strike not awry for saving of thine honesty cranmer was of all men of his time most powerful in hastening the english reform he erred in favouring the divorce of henry and catherine he was rewarded by the king with the highest ecclesiastical preferment in his gift the archbishopric of canterbury but cranmer was a pure and unselfish man and expressed only his real convictions when he afterwards yielded to henry so far as to pronounce his marriage with anne boleyn void he was still the same pure man but unwisely and irresolutely submitted to the pressure of the king cranmer became one of the regents of the kingdom after henry's death the young edward who succeeded henry was a protestant but he died early and was succeeded by mary a rigid roman catholic the court was at once filled with men in sympathy with her the reformers were now in danger cranmer latimer and ridley were thrown into the tower cranmer in a moment of weakness signed a recantation but soon withdrew it he with latimer and ridley was burned at the stake in fifteen fifty six his last words were as he held in the flames the hand with which he had written his recantation this unworthy hand lord jesus receive my spirit the publication of the bible in the language of the people was the most powerful single agency in bringing about the english reformation tyndale translated the new testament which was printed in worms in fifteen twenty six and introduced into england and circulated quietly over the country miles cloverdale's translation of the entire bible appeared in fifteen thirty five this was the first complete english bible ever printed without bearing any imprint of place or printer the evidence is strong founded on the resemblance of types that it was printed in zurich by christopher freshover cloverdale also published several of the psalms in verse with musical notes the date is not known but it was probably before fifteen thirty eight the following was the way in which he set out his little book on its singing mission be not ashamed i warrant thee though thou be rude in song and rhyme thou shalt to youth some occasion be in godly sports to pass their time the following is his first stanza of psalm one hundred thirty seven at the rivers of babylon there sat we down right heavily even when we thought upon zion we wept together sorrowfully for we were in such heaviness yet we forgot all our merriness and left of all our sport and play on the willow trees yet were thereby we hanged up our harps truly and mourned sore both night and day 
Matthew's Bible appeared in 1537 with the royal sanction. Cranmer's translation of the Bible had, likewise, the royal approval, and was powerful in gaining many minds to the cause of reform. In addition to the scriptures, other writings were circulated, as formularies of doctrine and the public services. Among these must be mentioned, the Ten Articles, the Bishop's Book, the King's Book, and the King's Primer. Then comes Erasmus's Paraphrase of the Scriptures, which, in 1547, was placed in the parish churches. In the same year, the first Book of Homilies went out, with the royal approval. In 1549, the First Communion Office, Cranmer's Catechism, and the First English Liturgy, or Book of Common Prayer, were issued. In 1552, the Second English Liturgy, or Book of Common Prayer, was ordered for use, while in 1553, the Forty-Two Articles of Religion and the Larger Catechism were approved and enjoined. At Henry's death, Protestantism in England still continued to be an uncertainty. Much had been done, but no fixed state of things had been reached. Protestant influences were permeating the masses, and this was the most hopeful sign. Both the king and his subjects had rejected the Pope's supremacy. The people had become acquainted with the Bible, and many now possessed copies in their own tongue. The monasteries had been suppressed, and their vast wealth secularized. A visitancy to arrange services and preach Protestantism was ordered throughout the kingdom. Religious formularies were made binding upon the people, and all the ecclesiastical offices were filled with Protestants. But Rome was still watchful for the opportunity of restoration in England. It was too fair a land to lose. Besides, there was a powerful party at home which was eager to restore the old order, and, by so doing, to bring itself to power and wealth. End of chapter 9